When I arrive, Jean always asks for orange juice. And he muses aloud, if only it could be mixed with vodka. Better yet, moonshine. He used to make it by the gallons, deep in the backwoods of Nelson County. I joke about making white lightning in a slow cooker and sneaking some in for him. He looks at me like I'm crazy. You can't make no moonshine in a crock pot. I say, how do you know? Maybe you can. Each time I leave, I kiss him firmly on the cheek. He beams and says, well, that made my day. One day, he's not bundled up, and under his shirt, I see a tattoo. It reads, Alice loved Jean. I ask who Alice is, and he says she was his first wife. On another visit, he tells me about a second wife who died at 37 from drinking too much. I don't ask if she drank too much moonshine. His dogs are always by his side, Jack on his right, Lucy tucked under his arm on the left. Though it's February, they are still wearing the festive Christmas collars I bought. They seem to take up half the bed. Underneath the blankets, Eugene is so thin. In volunteer training, you learn that nutrition changes drastically at the end of life. The body of someone with a life-limiting illness is in the process of shutting down. Less nutrients and calories are needed to convert to energy, so their appetite diminishes. This is totally normal and to be expected. But I bring hearty sausage and egg biscuits or fried chicken from Kenny's anyway. His favorite things to eat when he was able-bodied, still working as a landscaper. It's okay that he doesn't eat much. I'm happy just to sit next to him. Today, my patient is a 92-year-old woman who lives at home with her grandson. My three-year-old proudly calls her Grandma Ruby and delights in our weekly visit. I doubt she remembers Grandpa Eugene, and she probably won't remember Grandma Ruby either. But I will never forget them. <laughs>